much, Your Honor. May it please the Court. Concerns your per personal moral responsibility to give weight to the mitigation that you've heard about throughout the entire case, but especially in the last week or so. That is something that's different, and it's important, because the law is designed to have 12 people from our community to listen, as you folks have done, to reach into your lives, your beliefs, to reach that place I talked about when we were going through jury selection, to reach deep down inside, to touch your soul, and to give whatever weight you individually deem appropriate to the reasons for life that have been presented. And there is, there are a lot of reasons for life in this case, in spite of the fact that we have these aggravating circumstances. And I ask that each of you, individually, go through this process that the law requires. And each of you, individually, must decide the appropriate county after going through this waiting process. And you can only do that, I believe, after insight into yourself and into the evidence and the impact that the mitigation has. And as the judge stated earlier, and you'll have these instructions with you, when one or more of you, when one or more of you decide that the aggravating circumstances do not outweigh the reasons for life beyond a reasonable doubt, when that moment happens, because life is then the appropriate tool. And as we discussed during the jury selection process, each of you will respect the decisions of your fellow jurors. And I'm sure that each of you made that promise, and each of you will live up to that promise. Because the law in Ohio is always satisfied with a life the law is always satisfied because you as an individual have to make that type of personal moral decision. And the law respects that decision. We have attempted to show you throughout the case, quite frankly, and especially in the last week or so, the reasons why life is appropriate for Mr. Silva. And I'd like for you to think conceptually a little bit about the items we've had people testify about 
and how this fits. You heard a lot about his childhood, and you're going to have many records. And here to examine the evidence as you deem appropriate. But the documents prove Leona Davis, Ramona Davis, Jesse Hatcher Jr. What the purpose of that testimony is to show my client's childhood. Because childhood matters. You can't take a person's life at the age of 40, 45, or 50, or any other point in their life without understanding their childhood. And I think the members of the jury who have children, and even the ones that don't, you understand that. It's intuitive that a person's childhood matters. It affects them the rest of their life. And you heard graphic testimony from more than one person concerning the household where Anthony was raised. No, he wasn't beaten like Leona. No, he wasn't beaten like Ramona. No, he wasn't beaten like Jesse. But that doesn't mean it didn't affect him. And I think you heard testimony about that from the experts. And you heard testimony, and you can make inferences from testimony, how he was at times beaten by his mother. I mean, imagine as a small child living in a house like this where I think there's nieces and uncle, but basically siblings. I mean, child, children of similar age growing up in the same house. How they're tortured. I agree with Mr. Bombeck. These poor children were tortured. But you're living among that torture, and you're sleeping one night, and because, I don't know, the dishes aren't clean, the floors are clean, something is amiss, so the mother goes up, st up the stairs to wherever her child is sleeping, Anthony Sowell, and beats him with an electrical cord while he's sleeping. Imagine the effect that has on a child in the context of the rest of what's going on in that house. And you heard more than once about how all of the children, all of the children couldn't wait to get out of that house. Some ran away. Some set it on fire. What's going on in that house to make these children react like that? Torture. You bet there was. Terror. You bet there was. And Mr. Sowell suffered from that as well as a child. He didn't run away like his two nieces and his nephew and even his sister later on. He had nowhere to go until he decided to join the Marines to escape that household, to escape the unloving childhood that he had. Not that, you know, not that, you know, I'm sure he loves his mother. I'm sure his mother loves him. But I think you heard graphic evidence of how dysfunctional that household was, the inconsistency within that household. That is mitigating evidence. That's a reason to choose life. You know, if, the, if someone is caught now tying a child up and beating them as described by the Leona, Ramona, and Jesse, that person goes to prison. And there's a reason they go to prison. Those are serious crimes. Our society doesn't stand for that. And the psychological effect that that has on children, not only the ones being beaten, but the ones living in that environment, is severe. And causes problems down the road. Other mitigating evidence. I'm glad we can agree on one thing, the honorable military service. And that is not to be underestimated, folks. I mean, you have a child coming from this, I hate the phrase, but dysfunctional environment this terrible environment, a house of torture, by the state's own words. But somehow Anthony pulls it together enough to try to funnel his energies into something positive. He was going to join the Army, decided he heard somewhere where the Marines were tougher, he was going to prove to his mother that he was worthy of her respect. And that's what he did, folks. And you have the record. You heard Mr. Bansley. Not only did he serve honorably, 
he distinguished himself at the first opportunity in boot camp. And I suggest to you that his honorable military service of seven years, seven years in the United States Marine Corps, that in and of itself is worthy enough for a life sentence. That is but one fact, but it is of such weight that that in and of itself is sufficient for a life sentence. But that's not all, folks. That's not all. When he got out, when he got out of the Marines, he struggled. Moved back into East Cleveland. East Cleveland had changed. I think you heard testimony about that. When he left, you know, the school system was pretty good. When he left, things were okay in East Cleveland. When he came back seven years later, drugs had infested the area. A lot of things had changed. And he struggled. He worked. And that's another important factor. He worked. This is a working man. You don't have the records. Look at the Social Security records, the Ohio Department of Taxation records that prove this man worked from as a teenager before he left Page Avenue up until the time of his heart attack. He worked. He paid taxes. We have those records. That is mitigation. That is something that's to be respected. And that is another piece of mitigation, another reason for life on the scale. And it's not to be underestimated. You know, and speaking about where, I mean, he, he, he committed a crime, he pled guilty to it, we're not here to relitigate that. He paid his dues. He did his time. And when he's in prison, you know, maybe there's no such thing as a good prisoner. He's well behaved. He's not causing problems. You have those records. Look at his work evaluations by the staff. You'll see they're all very good evaluations. No, it's not good that people commit crimes and go to prison. But I think it gives you some insight as to the structure. It gives you some insight that when he goes to prison now, because he obviously is going to prison for the rest of his life, it's just a matter of does he go to prison for the rest of his life or does he go to death row waiting to be executed. But I think the purpose of providing you those records and the jail records from here in county jails to show that he's not going to be causing problems, and that's worth something. That should be worth something. But you don't have to worry about this man causing problems once he's in prison. That's not his history. And there's a significant history to go by. Now, the prosecution mocks Roosevelt Lloyd by fair game. But the importance of what Mr. Lloyd has to say goes beyond the friendship. And they were friends. I mean, no question about it. They were friends. You heard that. That's worthy of belief. And what Roosevelt said about our client being human, in spite of his frailties, in spite of his faults, in spite of being a criminal, committed criminal at the time, I mean, that's what he was. But there are human qualities there that Mr. Lloyd tried to express to you. And folks, you know, we've tried to give you as much information as is available about Anthony so well. Yes, we knew he was a convicted rapist, but we were confident you could see beyond that as to his level of sincerity, as to his opportunity to know the things he talked about. And it's important because he described, and this comes in through Dr. Dr. Wood's testimony as well, the obsessive compulsive <coughs> symptoms or traits that Anthony has displayed. And that was the main reason for his testimony. He loves Anthony. There's no question about it. It may be hard for us to understand how two men who are doing time in prison, serious time in prison, years and years of their life, why they're worthy of anything. But I think you saw the human side of Roosevelt Lloyd, who tried to explain to you the human side of our client. And that is mitigation. That is a reason for life. There are human qualities there. He's been portrayed as a monster. The aggravating circumstances are disturbing, no question. But there is a human there. There's a loving person who's loved by others, who does love others, and he is worthy of life. Thank you.
judge read you instructions of law earlier, and I remind you, keep this in mind, because the law requires it, that you must, in fairness and mercy, in fairness and mercy, weigh the reasons for life, the mitigating evidence. And mercy is important. We are human beings, all of us. Mercy is a human quality. Not mercy for the crimes that he committed or the aggravated circumstances. Not mercy for that. But what the state is asking you to do is eliminate this man from the face of the earth. Execute him. That's what they're asking you to do. And what you need to keep in mind is that when you execute a person, you're executing, you're killing their entire life. You're executing the abused child. You're executing the honorable Marine. You're executing the well-behaved prisoner. You're executing the man who held down a job. And that's what the state is asking you to do. And in fairness and mercy, you need to make that personal moral decision as to the weight of the mitigating evidence for the reasons for life. Now the state has obviously disputed vigorously <coughs> that Mr. Sowell has any mental health problem. We have brought out experts who are well respected in their fields, well educated, who have spent the time who have been careful, who have administered the appropriate test to help you understand Mr. Soto. But can anybody, can anybody honestly say that a man can live with four decomposing bodies down the hall? You know all the facts, folks. I'm not going to repeat it agonizing. But can anybody honestly say that a man in that situation doesn't have something wrong with him? Do we need a medical doctor? Do we need the best PhDs around? Do we need that to come in and explain to us something's wrong with this man, folks? Something's wrong in his head. That cannot honestly be disputed. Call it one thing, call it another. But this man is sick in the head. And no one with the right mind can dispute that. Everything happened here. The women start disappearing after the heart attack. That can't be disputed. February 07 or March of 07 is when he had this heart attack. You have the medical records. He lost his job. His world fell apart. His obsessions, his compulsions overcame him. He used to have the structure that he could not completely control it but control it to a point where he's not killing people. His heart attack destroyed what little structure he had in his life, destroyed his job, destroyed his relationships, destroyed everything he had. And I ask you to take a close look at Dr. Wood's report. Obsessions, compulsions. Sister Tressa, someone he loves dearly. She loves him. He would dispute that, I hope. When he's out of prison, he tries to help her. She's taking care of his elderly mother. He helps when he can. He has the love and support of that part of his family. This guy came out of prison labeled sex offender. What's the first thing he do, does within a week after doing 15 years, 15 hard years? What's he do when he gets out of prison? He goes to a reentry program and gets the help he can get. It's because he wants to work. He's a Marine. He's a working man. Work is important to him to the point 
to the point where after this serious cardiac event, he turns down rehab, a terrible decision. But he turns down rehab so he can go back to work, because that's what he knows. That's what's important to him. But he couldn't do the work any longer. I think that's clear. You have the records you heard from his employers and co-workers. But it's at that <coughs> point when everything falls apart. And you know, the state wants you to believe that all these homicides, all these aggravating circumstances took place because of a scorned love affair and an addiction to crack. My God, folks. If that's the recipe for what we've seen in this case, God help us all. Because I suggest there's hundreds, if not thousands, of similar people out there within this very county. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be more than a scorned lover and an addiction to crack. It just can't be a coincidence that his world fell apart and that these crimes took place and these aggravating circumstances took place because of a scorned girlfriend and crack. There's got to be something more. He's not right in the head. And we know that from the psychosis. We know that from the PTSD. We know that from the experts who have helped us understand the life that he's led. What makes him different from Ramona, Leona, and Jesse? maybe even Tressa, among others. He's never had any treatment for these horrible things he went through. They've all had years and years of treatment. Folks, I could stand up here and argue until the judge shuts me down. But I know you've paid close attention think you have understood what we're trying to say here. If I have omitted anything you find to be mitigating, don't let that stop you, and I'm sure you won't. Mitigation is whatever you find based on the evidence that is a reason for life, a reason for life for Mr. Silva. We've tried to present you with a complete picture of his, of his life, so you have a solid basis to make the, I may dare say, the most important decision of your life, whether a man lives or whether he dies. Mr. Solo struggled a lot in his life. He struggled as a child. He overcame that to join the Marines and was very successful. He got out of the Marines, worked, but struggled with drugs, committed a serious crime, pled guilty, went to prison for 15 years, struggled within prison, but worked well within that system, relatively well. He got out of prison and was motivated, motivated to do well. And he did well. He worked. How hard is it as a, uh, someone who's done 15 years in prison, a convicted sex offender, you're labeled, everybody knows it, to find a decent job. But he was able to do that. And then his world fell apart after the heart attack couldn't overcome the consequences of that. He just couldn't. And now he has to pay with the rest of his life. And to spend the rest of your life in prison is serious punishment. And should he be punished? Absolutely. Absolutely. He should never be a free man. He will never be a free man regardless of your sin. It's life without the possibility of parole multiple times over or death. That's the decision you must make. You must make a personal, moral judgment. Has the state proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt that the only appropriate penalty is death? I trust at least one of you and many more, I hope will find that life is appropriate. It's time to stop the cycle of violence. It's time to say, let's impose life. Let's stop the cycle of violence. Let's put this case to rest. 
Let's learn from it. Let's recover from it. Life is beautiful.